three-part series commemorating the birth 150 years ago of George Bernard Shaw. He first came to the public's attention as the quirky, irascible and immensely readable Cornor di Bassetto and went on to become, in W. H. Auden's words, simply the best music critic ever. But Shaw was more than a critic. Music was at the heart of his writing, underpinning not only his sense of language, but the very structure of his plays. In this new three-part biography, director and writer Michael McCaffrey looks at the Shavian century through the music he loved and occasionally loathed. Actor Derek Chapman reads from Shaw's letters, diaries, and, of course, his criticism. George Bernard Shaw, Sounding the Century. Few towns are duller out of the season than Dublin. Tall brick houses browbeating each other in gloomy respectability across the white streets. Broad pavements promenaded mainly by the nomadic cat. Stifling squares wherein the infant of unfashionable parentage is taken for the daily baking that is its substitute for the breezes and the press of perambulators on the Bray Esplanade or the Kingston Pier. Or so it seems to the observer whose impressions are only eye-deep and derived from the emptiness of the streets, the unvarying dirt of window panes and the almost forgotten ugliness of the window curtains. Its dullness neither waxes nor wanes. It is immutable, unchangeable, fixed as the stars. When Somerville and Ross evoked that Dublin summer scene, they talked of the North Side on a Sunday in August in the mid-1890s. But the details could be carried over the years and over the Liffey without much damage done either to reputation or fact. And our story starts there, on the South Side, some 40 years even before Charlotte's, when, on Saturday, July the 26th, 1856, George Bernard Shaw was born to unfashionable parents in the equally unfashionable Sing Street. He was to go on and go away to become perhaps the most famous writer since Shakespeare. Dramatist, controversialist, activist, reformist, socialist and superman. His knowledge was staggering, his enthusiasms manifold, and his passions unflagging through a life which lasted almost a hundred years. Over the next three programmes, we'll be looking at one of those passions, music, a passion which enlivened and sustained him, soothed and infuriated him. He wrote brilliantly about it, composed plays in imitation of it, and was recognised as a genius by the greatest musicians of his age. And just as his long life saw the world change beyond measure, so it saw music change, develop and explode. He was born at the charge of the Light Brigade, as Verdi was writing Simone Boccanegra, and went on to outlive Hiroshima and hear Britain's Peter Grimes. This is the soundtrack to his century.
A lifelong socialist, GBS was born nevertheless to parents with what were commonly called expectations. In an Irish marriage, passion took a pretty third place to property and position. Bessie Gurnley's family were in trade, and she was anxious to rise in the world. George Carr Shaw was almost 30 years her senior and practically penniless, but he had connections with the castle and an uncle who was a baronet, Sir Robert Shaw of Bushy Park. So it was a marriage made, if not exactly in heaven, then at least in Harold's Cross. But the family had objections. George was considered a buffoon, albeit an amiable one, and while he was good enough to introduce Bessie to the salons and scions of the ascendancy, he was certainly no match for her as a husband. Besides, it was rumoured he drank. Bessie refused to believe it. Confronted, he assured her of his lifelong commitment to the principles of total abstinence. She dug in her heels, but so did her formidable Aunt Helen, with the result that Bessie secured her man, but lost the substantial dowry the family had set aside for her. George's devotion to teetotalism proved more honoured in the breach than the observance. George was an alcoholic, skilled at maintaining outward appearances of respectability. But once behind closed doors, Bessie discovered the extent of the problem. His wardrobe was full of bottles. Empty bottles. Some accommodation was reached, clearly, for three children came in quick succession. But she felt disappointed and cheated. The house was poor and joyless. Bessie was neither homemaker nor mother. The children were treated as furniture, abandoned to the care of servants who were unfit to have charge of three cats, let alone three children. A devil of a childhood, rich only in dreams, frightful and loveless in realities. Dublin is a city of derision at best, but in our house, reverence did not exist. Poverty, ostracism, disgust, three children, a house rented at 30 pounds a year or thereabouts, a drunken husband, incapable of improving the situation. It says a great deal for my mother's humanity that she did not hate her children. She did not hate anybody, nor love anybody. Bessie found her refuge in music. Mr. George John Lee was making something of a name for himself in Dublin musical circles, and Bessie became his amanuensis, copyist, arranger, and star performer. In return, he became her lodger, and as his career flourished, the whole household removed from the shabby gentility of Sing Street to the splendour of Stephen's Green. Lee was the master now, and George Carshaw simply referred to as the hermit. Bessie and Lee took Dublin by storm in subscription concerts and seasons of opera with international soloists. When no less an artist than Madame Lablache refused to accommodate Lee's demands, he shrugged his shoulders and asked Bessie to carry on. Lee had evolved a technique of singing called The Method. Based on the principles of the bel canto, The Method was also based on what passed for sound scientific knowledge at the time. It was loudly advertised that Lee had carried out dissections on songbirds to better understand the vocal apparatus, and it was rumoured more darkly that he dissected human cadavers to further his guilty knowledge. As his ambitions pushed him to greater triumphs, unrest grew in certain quarters, particularly among the patriarchs of the Dublin ascendancy, who mistrusted this flashy Svengali with his wild ideas and exotic appearance. His nemesis proved to be Sir Robert Prescott Stewart. <laughs>
Hymn writer, academic, and the most highly regarded Irish musician of his day, Stuart was incensed as the Catholic coachman's son became a popular and successful society figure, even enjoying the plaudits and patronage of the Viceroy himself. Stuart saw Lee as an imposter, a charlatan, and said as much. But equally, perhaps, he sensed that Lee was a new way, a new direction for Ireland which would take it outside the old unionist certainties, threatening the complacency and security of people like himself, and bring about a new mix of castes and creeds which would give it a viable future. A musician himself, it was an affront to his very being that such promiscuity was taking place in the name of music. A civilised man, Stuart waited his opportunity, and when Lee announced a concert for his own benefit, Stuart persuaded everyone entitled to a free ticket to attend. The house was full, but the cash box empty. Then, the next concerts were suddenly poorly attended. His victim badly winged and hemorrhaging capital and reputation, Stuart moved in for the kill. In a matter of days, Lee had sold up and gone to London. To everyone's astonishment, Bessie took her daughters and followed him. She was 42, but there was nothing else for it. It was her destiny. Many years later, Shaw was to reconstruct his mother's flight in the most favourable light. Dublin was close to her, and she had to earn her money for her children and invalid husband. He never recorded what he felt about her abandoning him. He was only 15. But he expressed the crisis simply enough. The musicians had gone, there was no more music. So he set about making his own. Having purchased one of Wheel's handbooks, I began my self-tuition. Not with Charney's five-finger exercises, but with the overture to Don Giovanni, thinking rightly that I had better start with something I knew well enough to hear whether my fingers were on the right notes or not. First of many reinventions, Shaw turns an emotional catastrophe into a personal triumph. We applaud his sheer courage, his application, his determination not to let the silence and the dark close in again. But he's going directly to Giovanni with its murdered fathers, rejected lovers, its unrequited passions and unrewarded fidelities, its societal uncertainties and the sheer emotional terror which besets its characters for more or less all of its length is surely significant. Giovanni contained more or less everything that had happened to Shaw in the first 15 years of his life. The only way to survive now was to master it, to be able to play it himself unaided. It was the first step in his creative evolution, his first move in reconstructing himself as the Superman. But he learned to play well enough to take a vocal score and learn its contents, to play stylishly the bel canto repertoire, assorted operas and oratorios and piano arrangements of chamber music and symphonies. He learned too the social value of the piano just as later he was to discover its indispensability on the footslopes of amorous philandering. Grown-up Shaw would love us to think that the only reason for his learning the piano was to fill in a gap that any radio or CD player or iPod could fall into today, but there was more to it than that. Music was a world to him, other and beyond the one he was forced to live in now, and its sounds were a language shaping and expressing ideas that had no words and feelings, that still had no meaning, but were as clear as daylight to him. Music came sometimes like an answer to an unspoken question, sometimes like ghostly echoes from another world. And then he discovered Wagner.
Wagner, the eminence terrible of European music, was rather off the map as far as Bessie and Lee were concerned, and Shaw owed his introduction to a fellow lodger, Chichester Bell, who suggested that Wagner was the only man and that he was the composer of genius. Shaw had his misgivings, but he respected his friend's judgment, took his cue, and bought a vocal score of Lohengrin. He was converted at once. Left to his own devices, Shaw was like any other teenager, reading and dreaming and talking a good match. He left school at 15 and even then his formal education had been decidedly patchy. Unlike other boys of his class, there was to be no first degree at Trinity, no legal or medical training, no convenient place in a family firm to keep him busy until he inherited. His first job was collecting rents from tenants whose slum accommodation was considered to be the worst in the empire. It was to inspire his first play, Widower's Houses, which, intriguingly, he wrote under the working title, Rheingold. Shaw was at once shy and obstreperous. Labelling himself the downstart, he had a contempt for Dublin ways and prejudices which verged on hatred. To his few friends, he was the ideal companion. Clever, bright and dangerously irreverent, he was given to passionate enthusiasms, lunatic pranks and all-consuming obsessions. As befits a high Victorian, he was steeped in the iconography of the Romantic era, the Earl King and the Flying Dutchman, Manfred and Bedzeppa, but most of all, Faust. With his friend McNulty, he talked endlessly of the Faustian pact and the role of Mephistopheles, so frequently invoked that he was known simply as Mephi. Mephi was the invisible friend and sole arbiter of taste and conduct on every occasion. Sonny and McNulty affected Mephistophelian habits and demeanour, or so they thought, so that a barbed remark or a cynical jest would always be finished off with the rider, as Mephi would say. Shaw went to lengths as soon as nature provided him with the wherewithal to mould his appearance on the Red Devil, just as he cultivated the mocking, sardonic style he knew so well from Goethe, and of course Guno. <laughs> Sonny felt he was destined for great things. He would make his mark somehow as an artist or a musician, a great singer or a world-famous maestro. He would make the world a better place and banish poverty and squalor. But when one of his colleagues scoffed that every young shaver thinks he will amount to something, Shaw took it as a challenge. Rather than stay in the city of derision, 
he would turn his face to London and his future. And so, shortly before his 20th birthday, he set out for Kingstown. He was not to return for 30 years. However much Sonny expected to find the streets lined with gold, the harsh realities proved disappointing. He fell more or less at once into post-teenage inertia and was happy for his mother and sister to provide for him. I did not throw myself into the tide of life. I threw my mother into it instead. <laughs> But it was Lee who came to Sonny's rescue. He had been asked to contribute a musical column to a magazine called The Hornet. The only problem was that Lee couldn't string two words together, but he knew a man who could, and so GBS was invited to be his ghostwriter. The columns were lively, perceptive, opinionated, witty, and often downright rude. Shaw, at this point in his life, had practically nothing worth saying, and worse still, no style to say it in. But he didn't let that stand in his way. Schubert's string quintet in C, opus 163, beautiful though its themes are, is decidedly too long. The composer fell into the error, an habitual one with him, of developing the principal movements at a length quite disproportionate to his resources in variety of form, and hence the effect of the quintet as a whole is wearisome. It was put to the Hornet's editor that either Lee knew nothing about music, or that somebody else was pretending to be Lee. Either way, reputations were at stake and a deception was being practiced. The column was withdrawn and apologies were issued, but business dropped and Lee was sent packing. When the Hornet finally died, Shaw attributed its demise largely to his efforts. The Hornet, with my assistance, died, and my sins are buried with it. But I still keep in a safe hiding place a set of the critical crimes I contributed to it, much as a murderer keeps the blood-stained knife under which his victim fell. But the victim here was Lee, rather than a second-rate rag which merely suffered the same fate as a hundred others of the time. Claudius to Sonny's Hamlet, was Lee being punished for replacing a father and taking Sonny's mother from him? Whichever way, Sonny was out of a job. Left to his own devices, Shaw continued to leech off his mother and sister, who was now a rising star in light opera. But in reviewing for the Hornet, he had discovered the power and influence that the written word possessed, and over the next eight years, he struggled to write novels and plays some of which were completed, and some simply abandoned in mid-sentence. Write about what you know, they say, and in Love Among the Artists, GBS wrote about music. In this early novel, Owen Jack is a composer, and Love Among the Artists shows a life directed towards art. Anything else is secondary. Personal relationships are to be looked at in terms of convenience or necessity, and marriage kills the heart and keeps it dead. One should rather starve the heart than overfeed it. Better still, to feed it on fine food, like music. Shaw modelled Owen Jack on a number of people, principally himself, but the character also owed a huge amount to a musical giant, someone who was in music everything that the young GBS hoped to be in letters. Beethoven.
people worshipped Beethoven, regarding him perhaps as the single most important artist of the 19th century. For him, Beethoven was defiance incarnate. Nobody but Beethoven could govern Beethoven. And when he refused to govern himself, he was ungovernable. It is this turbulence, this deliberate disorder, this mockery, this reckless and triumphant disregard of conventional manners that set Beethoven apart. He was a giant wave in that storm of the human spirit which produced the French Revolution, anticipating with revolutionary courage and frankness all the moods of the rising generation of the coming 19th century. Shaw loved the classlessness, the democracy of music, the fact that whatever it was, everyone heard the same thing, but no one could claim possession of its meaning. He loved its combination of order and chaos, of beauty and terror, of sensuality and scientific exactness. In the best hands, it was the revolution in action. And when in Heartbreak House, self-regarding, over-refined, self-annihilating British society meets a force bigger than its own capacity for self-destruction in the form of a German air raid, it's with German culture that Shaw and his fellow anarchists sign. Did you hear the explosion and the sound in the sky, says Hesione. It's splendid. It's like an orchestra. It's like Beethoven. By thunder, Hesione, it is Beethoven. Finding it impossible to hold down a job for long, he even advised prospective employees of his unsuitability for work. He seldom rose before 11. So it's all the more remarkable that he achieved what he did over the next decade. His days were spent in the British Museum reading voraciously philosophy, politics, music and music books and networking like crazy. G.K. Chesterton remarked later that if Shaw went up in a balloon, three weeks later he was an expert on ballooning and ballooning was added to the list of enthusiasms without anything else being dropped to provide a place for it. Indeed, his abundant energy, what one friend described as the enormous enthusiasm he has for enlisting you in the project known as GBS, turned the shy, shabby lad from Portobello into one of the most sought-after speakers and commentators on the bustling London scene of politics and public meetings. Shaw had found and embraced socialism, and it was to remain the golden thread that ran through the rest of his life. His increasing prominence in political circles, he drafted the constitution of the Fabian Society, which led in the long run to the Labour Party in Britain, brought him back to the notice of editors. His performances were always a tour de force, whether the crowd numbered two or two thousand, and the quality of his rhetoric was remarkable. As the decade grew to a close, he was invited to become a parliamentary sketchwriter for the Star, whose editor was T.P. O'Connor, known as Tay Pei. His mind never advanced beyond the year 1865, though his Fenian sympathies and his hearty detestation of the English nation disguised that defect from him. Tay Pei's assistant was impressed by Shaw's political credentials. I had already, 14 years before Lenin, read Marx and was preaching socialism on every street corner in London. And Shaw began to review the debates in Parliament. The effect of my articles on Tay Pei may be imagined. He refused to print them and told me that it would be 500 years before such stuff became practical political journalism. Too good-natured to sack him, Tepe moved Shaw over to the music column where it was assumed he could wreak less havoc than the outgoing critic Engels, who was the most hated music critic in Europe. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Just as he had assumed Lee's identity to write for the Hornet, so he created another fictitious monster for the star, Corno di Basetto.
outset, Connor was making headlines. Who was this mysterious foreign gentleman? His name sounded Italian, but he wrote English like a costermonger. The patronym suggested an aristocratic background, but the style showed no respect. The connotations were refined, noble, considered, but the articles were brash, iconoclastic, confrontational. One part of town considered his views informed, refreshing, a breath of fresh air. The other thought he was a charlatan, a rogue who knew nothing, and who was pulling the wool over everyone's eyes. A phantom of the opera, this musical Jack the Ripper, seemed to be at every musical event, and sometimes his refusal to review was as devastating as his attendance. the Rubicon, take a pair of rosy lips, take a figure trimly clad, such as admiration whets, be particular in this, take a tender little hand, fringed with dainty fingerettes, press it, press it, in parenthesis, Take and keep them if you can, if you can. Take all these lucky man. Take and keep them if you can, if you can. Take a pretty little coat, quite a miniature affair, hung about with trellised vines. Furnish it upon the spot with the treasures rich and rare I've endeavored to define. Live to love and love to live, you will ripen at your ease, growing on the sunny side. It has nothing more to give, you're a dainty man to please. If you're not satisfied, not satisfied, I'm Upon it if you can, if you can, take my counsel, happy man, act upon it if you can, if you can. Take my counsel, happy man, act upon it if you can, if you can, if you can, act upon it if you can. I have not even been to the Savoy Opera. Do not be disappointed by this eager reader. We know the exact limits of Mr. Gilbert's and Sir Arthur Sullivan's talents by this time, as well as we know the width of the Thames at Waterloo Bridge. And I am just as likely to find Somerset House under water next Easter or autumn as I am to find the gondoliers one hair's breadth better than the Mikado. Mr. Gilbert's paradoxical wit astonishing to the ordinary Englishman is nothing to me. As to Sir Arthur's scores, they form an easy introduction to the dramatic music for perfect novices, but I had learned it all from Meyerbeer, so there is no musical novelty in it for me. Besides, Sir Arthur's school is an exploded one. No, I am as absolutely certain of what the gondoliers is as I shall be when I have witnessed the performance. The Star was a halfpenny newspaper aimed at the new reader, literally the first people of their class who, thanks to the 1871 Education Act, were able to write and hungry to know. I was not catering for a fastidious audience. It was addressed to the bicycle clubs and the polytechnics. I purposely vulgarized musical criticism, which was then refined and academic to the point of being unreadable and often nonsensical. 
If I occasionally carried uh, to the verge of ribaldry my reaction against the pretentious twaddle and sometimes spiteful cliquishness found in other journals, think of me as heading one of the pioneer columns of what was then called the New Journalism, and you will wonder at my politeness. Politeness may be stretching it, rather. Corner was certainly less aggressive than the ghost of Lee, but he was often firmly and uncomfortably to the point. On Tuesday, I received an invitation to attend the dress rehearsal of the new opera at the Opera Comique that evening at 7.30, and I took care to be in the theatre punctually at a quarter to eight. When I entered, I was much puzzled to find a huge orchestra thinly scraping through a minuet in a state of the wildest excitement. My neighbour told me that the conductor was Mr. Milton Wellings, I gazed with inexpressible awe at the composer of Some Day, for I know, as well as Monsieur Dumas Fils, how much merit it takes to make even a small success. And I admire a man who is as anxious about a hopelessly dull little piece to which he has written a dance tune as Wagner was about the 1876 Nibelungen performance at Bayreuth. Sang of foie can be acquired. Earnestness is a gift from the gods. Corno's biggest enemy was humbug. The exclusivity and rank snobbery that beset English music filled him with contempt, and he particularly objected to the hijacking of music for establishment purposes. Musical life was stopped full of exactly the same committee prejudices that had driven Lee, and of course his mother, out of Dublin. shared Wagner's contempt for Brahms and Bruckner. I've been unable to find out what he thought about Mahler, but I suspect it was something after the same. There was, for sure, more than a whiff of Mr. Sowerbury about the Brahms Requiem. A solid piece of musical manufacture, it could only have come from the establishment of a first-class undertaker. Besides, I object to Requiems altogether. The dead march in Saul is just as long as a soul in perfect health ought to meditate on the grave. A requiem overdoes it. For three seasons, Colo di Bazzetto laid siege to the musical establishment. Despising the whole social aspect of the London scene, he had no mercy for its latest fashionable lions and accessories. Ignaz Paderewski got extremely short shrift. was over, the audience in wild enthusiasm, and the piano a wreck. Paderewski is, at least, exhilarating, and his hammer play is not without variety, but his is the touch that hurts, and the glory of his playing is the glory that attends murder on a large scale when impetuously done. Impatient for change, Corno sometimes took exception to the music itself. The second rate offended him, and the well-mannered organist's music, which passed for composition in England, was a red rag to him. Why was English music so prissy, so utterly devoid of any passion at all? 
In England, music is still the chastest of the muses. And how respectable she is. Virtuous and rustically innocent. She has learned her morals from Handel, her ladylike manners from Mendelssohn, and her sentiment from the bailiff's daughter of Islington. And the worst of it was that Victorian composers preferred music which, just like their railway stations, was massive, quasi-religious, ruthlessly efficient, empty a lot of the time, and filled with noise and smoke the rest. The last hundred years had seen a ten- and twenty-fold explosion in most British cities. Across the land, workers were taken out of the mills and mines and dragooned into musical activity. Brass bands and choral societies, whose efforts culminated in mighty festivals at Leeds and at Birmingham and Norwich, at the Three Choirs Festival in the Malverns, and a hundred other cities and town halls across the country. Major players were their leading lights. Sir Arthur Sullivan was involved in all of the above, persuading committees to commission new works from Gounod and Grieg, Wojak and Rubinstein and Tchaikovsky. And major conductors, Richter, Drankel, von Bulow, all appeared on the podium. The forerunners of today's great festivals at Salzburg and Edinburgh, Luzern and Santa Fe and Vienna, or some bizarre, self-congratulatory Freemasonry of the great and the good joining forces to keep society ticking over. All men shall be brothers, sang the Leeds chorus in the morning, before dragging the maestro's coach to the railway station that night. Shaw saw it all for what it was, a way of keeping the British beehive buzzing nicely and doling out, even to the Methodists' music, the brandy of the damned. Hell is full of musical amateurs. These huge events required an almost unending supply of music, which was tailored precisely to requirements. Shaw dubbed them Warder Street Oratorios because they were generated by the music publisher's determination to make money rather than any artistic or spiritual impulse. And he was right. Most of Sullivan's non-Savoy work was in this medium, and he approached it with no more artistry or dedication than he did a drawing room ballad. The work was often last minute and strung together in a sort of music by the yard style, with little attention paid to variety or texture because none was expected. The subjects were often religious, and this helped deflect criticism, as few critics wanted to be seen to be sacrilegious. Not that that bothered Corno. Even Mendelssohn, the patron saint of Victorian music, taxed his patience. He wrote beautifully, but, according to Shaw, he had nothing to say. St. Paul was like a Sunday school taken by a beautiful teacher, but even beauty in music wasn't enough if the message was missing.
One of the things that strikes me about Shaw's musical writing is the sheer breadth of knowledge he commands. He knows the repertoire, and you get the impression that he has a very clear grasp of what the composer wants and how to go about getting it. And all this is self-taught. He was exhaustive in his music and theatre going, travelling the length and breadth of London, and quite often taking in a performance every day, sometimes two on a Saturday. Part of his brief was to cover the widest possible range of venues, not just the half dozen or so society haunts in the West End, but church halls, people's palaces, mechanics institutes, charitable foundations, and of course the magnificent Crystal Palace on the southern edge of the city. The Victorian concert was a strange affair by today's lights. The notion that a programme would be built around a particular work and then framed by complementary material would have seemed academic and dull. If the modern concert is served a la Russe, with carefully balanced courses, then the Victorian concert was a buffet, a magnificent smorgasbord with something for everyone. Overtures abounded, often finishing a programme as well as starting it, and orchestral selections from operas were very much liked. Concertos with virtuoso soloists were prominent, and vocalists were more or less obligatory. One of the great stars was Adelina Patti, who, despite her artistry, was the last thing a singer should be as far as GBS was concerned. He thought her the Jekyll and Hyde of singers, capable of singing a great aria or folk song with passion, artistry and impeccable taste, only to burst forth in a series of meaningless encores and crowd-pleasing curtain calls. For the great exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851, the Crystal Palace was just that, a massive greenhouse over a thousand feet long and arranged something after a cathedral with nave, transepts and oratory. A huge organ had been installed and the palace frequently hosted the mass choirs and elaborate concerts which were so popular with the ordinary Londoner. Casts of thousands were not uncommon and three times that number attended the hugely popular Saturday afternoon concerts. Corno di Bazzetto went down as often as he could. When I went down to the Crystal Palace the other day, I knew I was not going to have a treat. Mr. Cowan was installed with a cantata. Still, it might have been worse. It might have been an oratorio. Just as a considerate dentist warms his forceps in hot water and hides it behind his back as he approaches you, so, Mr. Cowan disguised his cantata as an old English idyll. But he could not conceal the ominous fact that the libretto was by Mr. Joseph Bennett, who also supplies an analysis of the music, is said analysis being about as difficult as an experienced chemist would find that of a cup of tea. The composer reflects the spirit of old English music in almost every phrase. Well, St. John's Eve is the drawing room music of Maid of Ale in an old English fancy costume. Mr. Bennett has played up to the fancy costume hardly but vainly by flavouring his verses with such Augustan spices as gentle zephyr and describing his heroine as the fair, which only reminds my irreverence of Mrs. Simpkins in the ballad of The Resurrection Man. Then came the Resurrection Man, the corpse resolved to raise. He broke the coffin with his axe, and at the fair did gaze. Up started Mrs. Simpkins, says she, me gracious me. What are you with that axe about? What axe about? Says he with me fall diddle all the diddle I diddle dee. What a capital subject for a cantata, and what a title the resurrection man would make. <laughs> Thank you. 
Closing scene from Act One of Mozart's Don Giovanni with Thomas Allen, Carol Van Ness, Keith Lewis, Maria Ewing, and Richard Van Allen. The London Philharmonic Orchestra was conducted by Bernard Heitink. And that first program in the series, George Bernard Shaw, Sounding the Century, was written and presented by Michael McCaffrey. The reader was Derek Chapman. You can hear the second program in the series in the lyric feature next Monday evening at seven on RTE Lyric FM.